Bang, Bang, currently is a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Otaviano Canuto. <laughs> Great to have you, Otaviano. Please, Great to be here. Please, please have a seat. And uh, of course, I don't have to tell you that this is uh, going to be uh, no exception. This is going to be a very uh, animated and uh, very interactive session. So uh, your questions will be submitted through the app, and I will see them right here. Uh, but let, let's start right away, uh, Dominic. We don't want to be late for the match. So obviously, <laughs> uh, that, that is something that no one will forgive us in this part of the world. We will end at 7.15 sharp. But until then, Dominic, there's a lot to be discussed here because obviously inflation is surging nearly everywhere, impacting uh, nearly everyone. The drivers, of course, we've talked about it throughout the day. I think it's fairly well known. The pandemic, of course, the disruption to the global supply chain, as well as the war in Ukraine, of course, which is causing high energy and food prices to skyrocket. M what I want to know from you is, as a very experienced economist, how exceptional, if at all, is this current situation that we find ourselves in? Well, uh, may I add to the drivers, COVID and war, the pent -up demand, because a lot of demand has been uh, reframed during the period of COVID and mm. came out at the, at, mm. at the end. Well, I think it's rather exceptional. Exceptional because uh, it's an exceptional period. We have been experiencing uh, 10, 15 years, 20 years of globalization. Mm. And what we're living now is a period of fragmentation. Mm. See the IRA, for instance, in the United States, or thing like this. So the question that we must try to answer, I mean, there's three questions for me. One is, how long is it going to last? Mm. Second, will we have a, a so-called wage prices spiral, you know, the second ride effect? And second, should we let uh, monetary policy alone to try to solve the problem? Mm -hmm. and the first question is not that easy because uh, it may last rather long, depending on how sticky the prices are. I think Ottaviano is defending the idea that they're very sticky, and I'm afraid he's right. Mm -hmm. But there's a counter argument, the so-called uh, bull with effect, which uh, explains that uh, in such period you may have overproduction, which will uh, uh, make the prices down. Nevertheless, I think that to this first question, the answer is it will last rather long. The second is uh, it's not exceptional because we know very well this kind of a, a second right effect between wages and, and, and the prices. Again, two arguments. One is that the labor markets in the weights are pretty tight, mm. so difficult difficult to avoid increase in wages. On the other hand, the bargaining power of uh, the, the wage earners has been eroded during the last decade. So again, you don't know, but I still think, second answer, that it will happen. <laughs> the most funniest thing in this uh, month of December 2022 is that uh, an institution which has to fight against this, the second answer, namely the ECB, may be under strike of his uh, uh, salaries because they weren't increasing wages. So they will experience in the reality what, what, it, what it means. And then the third question, which makes things very new, mm. is that uh, there is a kind of a contradiction between on one hand the European Union, at least in Europe, mm -hmm. where uh, the countries have uh, unleashed a huge package to avoid people to suffer too much and decreasing by this package the real price of uh, energy for the people, which in textbook will appear as something which is very inflationary because fiscal expansion is supposed to. But there are some features that the textbook cannot capture, especially the fact that there is something such a disinflationary fiscal expansion, in my view, when those kind of subvention is used to maybe not to maintain at the same level, but at least to diminish the price of energy, you may avoid the second round effect. And avoiding the second round effect, finally, you make more against inflation than the monetary policy itself. So it's a very new situation from this point of view. The second thing which is new in monetary policy is that during the last 10 years, 
central bank models have proven be useless. Mm. Uh, they're based on old data. They cannot take into account change in regime, regime changes or tail events, and so they're just useless. And still, central bank want to apply the traditional policy. It looks to me as if uh, you will be seeing nails everywhere just because you have a large hammer. So the point is now that uh, in the US, fine. The demand is big and the Fed has some rational in his behavior. In Europe, where obviously a large part of inflation is imported, um, and cannot believe that it's the appropriate policy. You know, it's having a, a generalized uh, monetary policy tightening where the excess demand is localized is something which uh, appears to me a bit, a bit ridiculous. Last point, because we have the match. Um, I think that most, at least in Europe, uh, money policy maker are, uh, don't know exactly what to do. Peter Wunsch, the governor of the Belgium National Bank, just delivered a speech saying, oh, what we learn in this situation is that we don't know a lot about inflation. Oh, yes, of course, but you're supposed to. And then he said, we, as policy makers, we lost our moorings. So the ECB is now flying blind, and that's, for me, the big difference compared even to the previous period where Mario Draghi was at the head of the ECB and probably the big threat for the, the coming years. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly a lot of food for thought that you have given us uh, in your answer. I, we will, uh, without any doubt, uh, dive much further uh, and deeper into the subject matter as this discussion it involves, but Masoud, let me bring you in here at this particular point. You're a very experienced economist uh, yourself. The situation that we find ourselves in, clearly we've seen the patterns before over the years, in the 70s uh, uh, in particular, every now and then. Is there any element of the situation that we find ourselves in right now that is unique, that, that is distinctive from previous occasions? Well, I'd, I'd say a couple of, I mean, the unique part, I think, is the, what drove it. And, yeah. and as you've just discussed with Dominique, you know, we had COVID. We had the response to COVID, it's a big stimulus thrown in every country. And that's the stimulus we're now seeing working its way through the system. And then we had now the food impact coming through the war in Ukraine, energy prices, oil prices. So I think those are the factors. But what I would focus on is, is just two points. You know, the first one I would make is that... Uh, we can see the numbers on the latest numbers on inflation uh, show some slowing down of the rate. But slowing down is not the same as stopping. And also, if you disaggregate it, you see it's uh, uh, secondhand car prices in the US and, and uh, oil that seems to be, but labor market is still very tight. And the big worry I have is that you could get yourself into a situation where the second-hand car prices and, and oil go back to mean, but the sort of the average mean reversion, but you could still have tight labor markets. Then you get into that stagflation of the 1970s when you, it's very hard to bring uh, the inflation levels down without really hitting on unemployment. So the thing we should be worrying about is what's next year going to look at for the dynamic. And then that, of course, leads you to the risk that we will be worrying a year from now about the impact of recession. So Europe certainly is going to go through a recession in some way. U.S. technically is recession, not a recession, doesn't matter so much. It's going to be very low growth if you're going to deal with it. And then you come to all the emerging markets. I think that's what's, a, what's the meaning of all this for the emerging markets. And that's my second point. You know, if you look at the emerging markets, whether it's in the Middle East, North Africa region, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Latin America, inflation is increasing everywhere. This is a broad-based phenomenon. Governments have been trying to manage it. They're also being hit at the same time by the sharpest fall in emerging market currencies compared to the dollar since the Russian uh, 2008 uh, crisis. Their bonds, have dropped in value. 
their access to financial markets is more limited because when interest rates go up, international investors pull money right back out of emerging markets. All the portfolio flows start flowing back out because mm -hmm. they, they don't need to go. Why should they go look for an investment mm -hmm. and get a higher yield mm -hmm. in a country outside their comfort zone when they can get six, mm -hmm. seven, eight percent at home? So that, that's going to affect it. And this is quickly turning into a fiscal problem because most countries have tried to keep the price of food and energy down through subsidies. Subsidies are running at 3% of GDP in the MENA region now. Uh, next year, let's hope we get a little bit lower, but they're still going to be very high. That subsidy bill comes on top of already stretched finances. That leads them into borrowing more which is then making debt problems worse for a whole range of countries that were already on the margin of having as much mm -hmm. debt as they could handle. That debt is also more expensive because the interest rate on the debt is going up. So mm -hmm. I guess my point to you, Ari, is that I think we are going to have a very difficult 2023 mm -hmm. when we have to balance social pressures which will stop you from raising energy prices, food prices, getting rid of subsidies in most of our countries, and financial pressures which are going to tell you, mm. you need to tighten up because the markets are now downgrading your debt. Look at the number of countries and see what's happened to downgrades. More downgrades mm. this year than in any other year in the last 10 years. Look at the rates people are paying and you're going to see next year mm. a, that big tension which is going to be very hard to, to manage. So we're looking at a tough uh, 2023. Uh, I, I think so. Uh, that's uh, unfortunately not, not good news for anyone here uh, in this audience or beyond, considering the hardship that some are feeling already. Uh, but thank you, uh, nonetheless, Masoud, for, for your very realistic uh, assessment. And you, you, you said, of course, correctly, this is being felt and experienced all around the world, Harinda. But the truth is, it is being felt and experience differently around the world, isn't it? What, what, are the distinct, what are the differences, say, between somebody who's based in Marrakesh as opposed to somebody based in D.C. where you are? Well, you know, the work I do, which is focused on emerging markets, development, um, and global. Mm -hmm. So let me come from that perspective. But let me start with your question. Uh, how unusual is this period? First, this is the worst inflationary period we see in the last 20 years. That is correct. But the reasons for this inflation are different, as uh, M.D. Strasskorn has emphasized. COVID is thrown in, Ukraine is thrown in. Supply chains is another big reason. And Masood has emphasized. But I want to add to that that inflation rates are different in different parts of the world. It's not uniform. Mm -hmm. And some parts, and slightly disagree with uh, Masood here, um, I suspect that inflation in the US has peaked. You can argue about that. And what we are seeing uniformly this time, that not just the US, the central banks worldwide are, have started following the Federal Reserve. ECB is little behind, in my view. I think MD is right here. And they may need to continue. Let's see what happens in the US tomorrow. But they may begin to taper down the aggressiveness they have. But they will continue. I don't think we are seeing peaking of the interest rates in the US yet. Maybe another six months, another 12 months before they peak the interest rate. Now, what we are seeing is that inflation rates are going to be different in the US than in Europe. Europe will have higher interest rates, not just Germany where you live. It's going to be different in India, it's going to be different in China, and it's going to be different in Japan. Japan has been is the third largest economy in the world, and their monetary policy is different and their inflation rate is different, they're still very worried about growth rates. So rates are different in different countries. But I want to make three additional points. One, we are seeing to some extent a perfect storm. What do I mean by that? Sharp increase in interest rates over very short 
period worldwide. Not only US and Europe, but India and all kinds of other countries. That combines with record debt levels in most emerging markets, not only in Africa, but Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and I can keep on going. And combined with that, combined with that, very high level of dollar. And most debt is denominated in dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's a triple whammy. Combined with the fact that Masood mentioned, there's very little fiscal headspace mm -hmm. in most emerging markets. Now, to me, it means that most developing countries, what the fund in the bank calls emerging and developing economies, EMDEs, are going to be hit very hard in medium to long term, particularly because the largest single bilateral donor in the world is China, and is not really participating in debt write-off or descheduling fully. And they have more debt, bilateral debt, than mm -hmm. all bilateral countries combined. And we just finished a book on BRI. And it's not transparent what the terms are, and they're certainly not participating. So we are quite worried about the medium to long-term prospects for mm -hmm. developing and emerging markets. So that's my second mm -hmm. point. My third point is that I think the era of negative interest rates or very low interest rates is over for many, many years to come. Mm -hmm. And many countries, many people, many investors were getting used to free money. That is gone. So what does it mean for developing countries or all investors? I think from non-words, a lot of money which is made by Wall Street or by London city people is probably over. Savers will benefit. But emerging market economies are not going to get a lot of free money anymore. And they have to think very hard how they're going to find money to invest in infrastructure and climate change. So we're going to have adjustment. And Vistas can already hinted, maybe labor markets, we're going to see restructuring of the world, where labor will have more leverage partly because of the reason that Masood hinted at, versus capital, mm -hmm. question mark. Mm. Thank you. Th thank you so much, uh, Harinda, for, for providing the context. Uh, interestingly enough, you say uh, we are seeing the end uh, of the era of low uh, interest rates and the steady money supply uh, that we've seen up until now will no longer uh, exist as such. Of course, the role of the central banks will be discussed and need to be discussed. I, I will come to that in just a moment, but to round up the, the, the first round, and before we do, by the way, the drivers of today's inflation, we've talked a lot about Ukraine, we talked a lot uh, about the pandemic and supply chains. Um, the question I want to throw to you before I go to Taviano is what are the drivers of today's inflation rate? If you have any more aspects, any more elements, uh, any more factors that you think have not been mentioned yet, do so in the cloud, and I will, uh, we will see what comes up in just a moment. What are the drivers of today? Inflation. But, uh, Ottaviano, uh, le let me round up this first um, Q&A with the same question to you, namely about how unique, how extraordinary, how different this era is, if at all, that we're going through right now. Right. And uh, the answers by my three colleagues made my life easy because I can be only complimentary. Let me frame my answer to your question by remarking uh, that we are going through three different structural changes that must be kept in sight. Uh, first one, uh, we have shifted from a world in which the major discussion was on insufficiency of demand. Here at the same place we had in previous editions of the Atlantic Dialogue discussions here about the hypothesis of secular stagnation and so on. Now we have shifts to a situation in which the, the, uh, the blockage has come from the supply side. And several reasons for that. The pandemic gave us the war, uh, the great resignation, which is 
a phenomenon that has not been fully understood but is real. The rate of labor, labor force participation in the US, for instance, have never returned to the levels pre-pandemic levels. Uh, whatever be the hypothesis, because of uh, health issues, because of uh, uh, people could retire early because of the uh, levels of wealth obtained by, by uh, valuation of assets, whatever it be, and the shrinkage of uh, global labor flows. It's impressive how the, the uh, no entry of new uh, immigrants in the US has made this impact on labor force. And we go more. And there is another one, which is the changed world with respect to the, uh, the trade-off between efficiency and resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdelaziz and, and Mahmoud Abush and I wrote up, uh, made a research for the Atlantic. The, uh, and uh, we may have been very much optimistic when we thought that the shocks, not only the, the, the uh, climate-associated shocks and pandemic, and geopolitical shocks would limit the impacts of the reshuffling of global value chains to national security related sectors. Maybe we were too optimistic. We don't know exactly where this is going to, uh, where the new definition of strategic sectors will go up. But we are watching. Mm -hmm. The US has become the major protectionist uh, <laughs> economy in the world, the best economy. And this has cost implications. So uh, the, the, tri the, the balance between uh, resilience and efficiency has tilted against efficiency, and this is a source of shocks. So, uh, Masood, I fully agree. Uh, the data coming yesterday showed clearly how, at the margin, the core uh, PCE, the major impo most important index for the Fed, has really, in the last two months, reached the peak. Uh, there will be an inertial inflation uh, through the service and so on. But the fact of the matter, regardless of whether this current bout of inflation has peaked, we are now in a new era in which the, the, uh, the, the shocks are coming from the outside, mm -hmm. from, from the supply side. But there is a second point as well, as a consequence of this, uh, which is the end of the era of cheap and fully available liquidity by the central banks. Mm -hmm. This has changed. We have the whole decade. Uh, 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 Dominique pointed out quite clearly how the absence of fiscal policy as a proactive instrument particularly in the case of the US, but also in other parts, uh, laid the whole responsibility for counter-cyclically combating the tendency to stagnation to the central bank. This functioned to avoid crisis, but it has also had some side effects. Uh, one of them, the, uh, the relationship between the Fed and the financial markets, one in which the, the financial markets have become uh, pampered. You know, uh, the simple threat of uh, cutting out the support by the, the central banks, by the Fed, generated tantrums. Market became childish. And, uh, and, and twice, the Federal Reserve uh, had to uh, set back in its early reference in attempts to establish a QT, a quantitative tightening. But now it's for you. Now the quantitative tightening is, is on the way. Uh, and uh, there's no way one can expect the central bank to do the same thing that they did uh, in the last decades. And third, and finally, which maybe it's a compliment uh, because it has not been mentioned by my, my, my colleagues or panel, which is the following. It's a consequence of the first two. Mm -hmm. One difference between now and the previous two uh, crisis moments in recent history, that is to say the inflation in the 70s and 80s, and the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, is that now we have the combination of both. Debt has increased dramatically, not only in emerging markets and low economies, low income countries, but uh, there was a metamorphosis of finance with the banks being you know, curbed by the regulations enacted after the global financial crisis, but the degrees of leverage uh, of companies uh, through uh, the non-banking financial institutions is something that has not been in the radar, not of regulators. And uh, it may well be, and this is a very, we are watching signs here and there of a deep liquidity crisis. Mm -hmm. Well, we saw what happened to the UK. No one could expect the pension fund to be exposed as that. And so the, 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 the unknown known, the known unknown mm -hmm. is whether 
the two things, that is to say supply shocks and, uh, and the end of liquidity and, and interest rates hikes, might morph into a third source of, uh, of uh, uh, shock, which would be financial shocks. And they may come from many places, uh, you name it, mortgage uh, and so on. So I, I guess we have to, to, inc to incorporate the, this triad of a structural change that have happened in the last few years, uh, without which you cannot understand what's happening. Already, I think uh, it's very clear. This is a very content-rich debate with some disagreements, but as is expected when you have four uh, prestigious, esteemed economists here on stage. We're half-time, by the way, half-time on this panel here. Uh, we have 35 minutes uh, to go, so the plea is for the next rounds, uh, we're going to give uh, somewhat more precise and shorter answers. Before we do move on, let's see what the uh, audience came up with the question, what are the drivers of today's inflation. I thought we had the cloud up. If, if uh, we can put it up again just uh, for a couple of seconds to see. Many of the elements obviously have been stated, have been repeated. COVID has to be in there. Of course, the war has to be in there. But we see greed. Uh, we see lack of youth leadership, interestingly enough. Um, capitalism. Putin. <laughs> I, see, I see Putin up there, and I think that is very much tied, obviously, to the war uh, in Ukraine. And I think, Dominic, it's clear that uh, this inflation is affecting and is concerning everyone. Certainly, the high cost of living is one you've mentioned when uh, the prices rise uh, much, much faster than the wages, the decline in purchasing power, the erosion of real income. And of course, for businesses, it's never good, the lack of price stability if they cannot plan accordingly for the future. Let's talk about the central banks here for a second. 33 central banks have raised their interest rates this year, uh, this, uh, marking the largest rate hikes in two decades. Um, Harinda has already said this is the end of the era of low interest rate. According to you and your experience, should central banks continue their hawkish policies? Is this the right way to go to uh, keep this inflation in check, which is obviously the ultimate goal here? As I said before, uh, certainly some hike in interest rates was necessary. The problem is that you cannot solve the problem only with this tool. And that, which is sometimes difficult to understand by central bankers, has to be taken into account by politicians and governments. And then we come to, for me, one of the main questions. We are talking a lot about economics, which is very important. But for me, the main questions, two questions, are political. And the first one relies to what you say, which is the weakness of multilateralism today, which make it almost impossible to have a coordinated uh, policy, but mm. increasing the interest rate, which theoretically is very easy. I mean, everybody can understand that. But if we avoid, and Masood knows what I'm talking about, in 2008, a crisis which could have been very profound and a very profound recession, it's because at this time, the different countries in the G20 believed that multilateralism and co economic cooperation was the right thing to do. Now we are in a very fragmented world where this kind of action is almost impossible. Still, I believe that on ethics, I mean, in, in, in exchange rates, uh, an ethics policy, things can be done. Not like the, the Plaza Agreement in the 80s, we're not in the same period, but still something which allows to work together. There's a lot of uh, academic paper about that from uh, Gopina, from uh, Ash and Green and others. The problem is that we have an elephant in the room, which is China. And uh, cooperation without China has no sense anymore. It was, maybe it was not exactly the same 12 years ago, 14 years ago, but now it doesn't make sense. And cooperation with China is now, um, certainly has economic consequences, but it's a political problem. Mm. And as long as uh, during the US and China, the situation will be the one we contemplate, mm. uh, as long as it, it lasts, during this period will be totally impossible to have any kind of economic coordination. Mm -hmm. So the main problem for me is not interest rate or, as I said, more fiscal policy thing like this. That's tool for us because we like it. But the main thing is 
the political question, which is, in globalized world with uh, inflation, which is generalized, we need a, co a collective answer. There is no single answer. And the collective answer cannot be only the answer of 33 or 43, I don't remember exactly, the uh, yeah. central banks. It has to go further and be the action of governments and IFIs, and I will come to IFIs later on, because there is a second, I'm stopping here, but there is a second political problem, which is the possible revolt of the poor, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, well, of yeah. emerging and, and developing countries who are now uh, in a situation which is a bit bitter to swallow. They don't accept the fact that rich countries or European countries for the war are deciding something at their cost. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a big role not only for cooperation in, in, in between governments, but also for the IMF to go back to his core business and uh, renew the, the lending process. You know, you remember, all of you, that SDRs, a lot of SDRs has been uh, launched uh, two years ago now with a lot of promises to give them mm -hmm. to uh, emerging and developing countries, but very few has been done. So we have to go back mm -hmm. to a real safety net for those countries, and that's part of the global solution. Uh, the global solution very much being emphasized by Dominic Strauss-Kahn. We're talking, of course, Masoud, about the consequences of inflation in the world, but uh, more specifically also in the wider Atlantic. And Dominic, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn says, yes, of course, you need domestic policies, uh, policies, but the international cooperation aspect here is very much needed and somewhat, if I understand him uh, correctly, in decline. Uh, would you concur? Yeah, so I would say uh, two things in response to that. First, at the national level, Look, for 10 years, central bankers have had a very nice time. Everybody saw them as the saviors. Lots of easy money after the 2008-2009 crisis. 10 years, we've had lots of easy money. People have made money. Asset prices have gone up. Everybody loves the central banker, right? Now, they've got a next five years, very different job, which is actually to manage the pulling back. So they're going to be the break in the system they're going to be the people who make your life miserable. The politicians on the fiscal side will sort of wash their hands a bit of it and say, look, you know, Germany is providing more fiscal stimulus right now than, than any country, pretty much. And then you suddenly start saying, these central bankers are really the problem. So one thing I think if I were a central banker, I would say this is a good moment either to develop a thick skin you know, or to take early retirement, because the next five years, not going to be good for you, you know. <laughs> Second thing I want to say is international cooperation. All our projects of multilateral cooperation are based on the assumption that it is a cooperative world, and the machinery that we provide for cooperation is ways to harness the spirit of cooperation that is supposed to be the prior before you build the machinery. We are now in a world where the prior no longer holds. We are a fragmented world. The United States, I, see, I live in Washington. And if you're sitting and having this conversation in Washington, by now we would have had five times the problem of China in the conversation. So the United States and China are no longer competing. They're adversaries. They will be adversaries for the next decade. And in that context, what we need to design our mechanisms for solving problems in a non-cooperative world. And we don't have that because, you know, our machinery is, is based on, an, on a very different assumption. The last thing I would say, Ari, is that you know, we talked a lot about problems of debt. Debt problems are quite widespread now in many, many countries, emerging markets, low-income countries, Latin America, debt levels are quite high. And every newspaper has an article once a week about how many more debt defaults we're going to have next year. You know, we're going to have a lot of problems. My personal view, I go out on a limb on this, because my personal view is that you will not have as many defaults as people are saying, because the price of default for politicians is very high. If you default, you're not going to be in office for very long. You'll be replaced. But the way to solve your high debt problem, if you're a politician, is you do everything to avoid default, which is you cut back on investment spending, you cut back on social spending. So the real outcome of the debt problem will be a decade of lost development rather than a series of defaults. And that, I think, is 
we won't see it because, you know, if there's no default, there's no noise. But 10 years from now, we will see the result of it. Arena, picking up on what uh, Masoud left off with, and also Dominic, of course, as somebody who spent more than 25 years of his distinguished career at the World Bank, are we seeing a decline? Are we seeing a diminishing of international cooperation, particularly at a time like this, when perhaps it is needed most? Well, instead of giving you a long answer, let me give you a short answer. The answer is yes. And at the same time, I think a lot of problems we are talking about do require much stronger international cooperation. So uh, I think the international organizations, international cooperation are missing in action just when you need them the most. And let me make it real uh, so that people understand them. If I were in Egypt or if I were in Cairo or Colombo, I will talk quite a lot about food prices. Mm. If I were in Berlin, like you are, or if I were in Frankfurt, or anywhere else in Europe, I'll talk about energy prices. Mm. Where is the origin of the food prices crisis? It's blockage of grain shipments in the Black Sea. Where is WTO's agreements? Where is international cooperation telling the Russians or Ukrainians, why are the grain shipments to developing countries broken? The moment the shipments restarted because of cooperation with Turkey, I think your country of birth, and the UN mediating, the grain prices dropped in the international markets. They should have never stopped in my view. Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council, right? Who suffered? The Egyptians, the Sri Lankans, any country in Africa which imports grains. They had nothing to do with the war in Ukraine. They're actually friends of Russia. Many of them voted for Russia if they were members of Security Council or in General Assembly. Their people suffered. Energy is the same price. The Americans today, I pay for gasoline today less than what I paid before the start of Ukraine war, but not the Europeans. I'm not buying candles in, in the US. Mm. My energy prices are no longer, gas prices are mm. higher than before. So where is international cooperation? Yeah. It's missing in action. Mm. This is real life. People in emerging markets are suffering and the Europeans are suffering. Not the Russians, not the Chinese, not even Indians who are buying oil cheaper. So the answer to your question, the short answer is, international cooperation is not working today when it is needed the most, when WTO is needed the most, when Security Council is needed the most, when IMF and the World Bank needed the most. That is, of course, uh, Otavio, a very grave assessment, a grim assessment, but a very realistic one, I think, that uh, most speakers here are in agreement uh, with. We have, uh, I'm looking at the time, 20, 25 minutes left. I'm going to come to the audience for a couple of questions right. before we wrap up, but I do want to give the opportunity, obviously, to yes. respond to this. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, no disagreement, but I would say one must compliment uh, uh, my, my colleagues with a couple of things. First of all, the landscape in the case of emerging markets is very heterogeneous. Definitely, uh, well, regardless of the frequency of future defaults or not, but we know that low-income countries in general and some emerging markets are facing situations of unsustainable debt paths. And uh, as I titled one work that I did when I was at the bank, there's a situation in which procrastination is costly. Mm -hmm. The longer it takes, so the best thing to avoid uh, what Masoud aptly described as cutting expenditures on on, on, on what matters, uh, social uh, education and so on, would rather face an uh, unsustainable debt situation by calling on uh, a negotiation. But the situation is quite different. You know, the dollar this year appreciated against all other advanced economies' currencies. It also appreciated less so vis-a-vis -vis the emerging markets. The appreciation of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis emerging markets was not 
But some emerging markets had even appreciation against the dollar. That was the case of the Mexican peso, mm. the Brazilian real, and so on. Why? Not by chance. These countries, uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, the GDP performance was better because of uh, Ukraine. The, uh, the, the price shock of commodities ended up benefiting Brazil, even if it was uh, full of suffering for the poor people who were compensated. But the point of the matter is that we, have, we do have a very heterogeneous situation. But the fact of the matter is that the major risk is the one uh, pointed out of fragmentation. But there are different levels of fragmentation we can be talking about. Uh, it may remain limited, basically, to, let's say, high-tech and security-sensitive sectors, as it is the case of the ongoing proxy war between U.S. and China on semiconductors, or we will have an a real problem if it goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. I am potentially optimistic in that regard because, see, Trump did this. Trump extended his, bilaterally his fight uh, against uh, you know, uh, any imports and so on. You know what happened? Uh, the U.S. manufacturing industry suffered a lot. Maybe it's not by chance that Trump never mentioned the trade wars in the election year. So trade wars are costly. Uh, of course, the benefits of, uh, of uh, uh, strengthening positions in, in, in sectors security related may be strong enough to, to pay off for the governments, but maybe the, the economic incentives on the private sector side to go through fragmentation are not uh, strong enough to break it down. And finally, uh, to summarize, central banks uh, lived, I, we learned at school, the dilemma, either you know, inflation versus unemployment. Now we have a trilemma. It will be Inflation, unemployment, or financial instability. It's going to be a complex game uh, in this regard because of the increased debt, as I said. Uh, that's undeniable how uh, the corporate sector, households, and, and so on, have incurred in huge indebtedness along the, the last decade and, and since the pandemic. Certainly our distinguished speakers are filling our title, The Consequences of Inflation, with a lot of life, with a lot of... Uh, content and of course we're also asking and have been asking how to keep inflation in check something that obviously have been answered uh, from all speakers I, I do want to give you a chance uh, to come to you but also get the cloud in one more time about how to keep inflation in check obviously this is something very difficult to put in one word we all know this but we'll try anyway uh, after asking what the drivers of today's inflation is we're asking how to keep inflation in check. We'll, we'll keep this cloud running, but in the remaining 15 minutes, uh, I have, I'm going to come to you, but I, ha I have to ask you to be extremely disciplined. Uh, you have to be cooperative here and be a team player and be very precise and short in your questions so that we can actually finish this uh, pertinent session here on time. I think microphones uh, are standing by and uh, uh, yes, please. Please, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to combine. I'm going to combine the questions, and then come back to you for one final round. Please. Yeah. Oui. Euh, ma question est relative à l'inflation. En liaison avec la nouvelle politique industrielle protectionniste des États-Unis, euh, Jérôme Powell a décrété la guerre contre euh, l'inflation. Until the job is done. Et euh, une loi a été publiée qui s'appelle l'IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, qui est euh, finalement une politique de soutien à la transition euh, énergétique. Et donc les États-Unis subventionnent fortement toutes sortes, toutes sortes d'industries pour prendre le leadership de la clean tech et ce qui va pousser bien sûr à renforcer la recherche développement face à la Chine à relocaliser euh, parce qu'il y a toute une problématique de relocalisation des industries qui étaient en Chine mais en même temps euh, qui sont sur le sol européen qui vont pas qui vont être right. qui vont pas bénéficier right. 
des euh, subventions. I, I have to, oui, I, yes. I have to ask you to wrap okay. up, otherwise we Quel, won't be able to get any question, questions please. in. My question, please. Quelle réponse l'Europe peut-elle apporter avec un prix de l'énergie quatre fois plus élevé qu'en Amérique Taxer les importations américaines, ça s'appelle une guerre commerciale. Porter plainte devant l'OMC, ça me paraît difficile. Et finalement, comment l'Union européenne divisée peut-elle créer un rapport de force sur des questions de concurrence Thank you. We have 15 minutes left. You have to uh, work with me here, please, in the first row. You have to work with me to make this more precise. Oui, je vais Thank aller you. très vite. Uh, je suis l'auteur du, du papier sur l'inflation dans l'Atlantique 40. Mais je dois dire que je ne comprends pas le pessimisme sur le panel. Uh, L'économie, c'est des cycles. Uh, on a un cycle difficile. On va sortir de ce cycle. L'inflation a commencé déjà à ralentir, ça va continuer en, 2000, en 2023. Donc, laissons juste le cycle passer. Mais je ne crois pas du tout à, au pessimisme ambiant. Merci. Thank you. Can we pass the, yes, the microphone to, to the lady? Yes. Thank you. I think we can all agree that there are tough times ahead, but I was wondering what's your view on the opportunities as well, as they say that crisis yeah. breeds opportunity. Mm -hmm. We saw, for example, in 2008, uh, you know, uh, the need to reinvent the financial system. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. what's your view on, on what we can expect in a positive light mm -hmm. out of this crisis? Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, first row, please. Thank you. Uh, um, just a quick question that uh, we have been talking about since the COVID situation and the war in Ukraine about near shoring and friendly shoring, meaning trying to produce locally regional production and all that. But is it possible to think about a strategy like that when we have this economic situation that is so unstable? And also the second thing, really quick, who is doing the homework in your opinion right now? Which country is doing the homework? Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think a wide range and potpourri of very good questions here, which I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, this time go in the opposite direction, to be fair, because I know, Taviano, you've been coming in last. Uh, this time, we're gonna go the other way around. So go ahead, please. This is the opportunity, because the questions uh, help, can help us to complement. And by the way, you don't have to answer all of them. No, I know, yeah, yes, you and know. I want, and I want. Yeah. But first, thank you for calling attention to another source of, uh, of uh, inflation, of cost, which is the road to decarbonization. Let's not be naive. The road to decarbonization will be costly. And for good reasons. The carbon, the price of carbon, which is something good, something uh, important, hopefully generalized, is, is costly. You cannot, that's the idea. Second, the, uh, there is still a margin of uh, efficiency uh, to be covered by renewable energy vis-a-vis -vis the fossil fuel uh, uh, energy base. So if you want to move fast by adopting renewables, there will be costly implications with respect to energy, and that's okay. It's part of the deal. And thirdly, uh, something that we have to take into account as well is going to be the inflation uh, coming from the critical minerals. The humongous increase of demand of critical minerals all over the span that we're gonna watch as we move to renewable energy will be inevitably costly. Uh, all the estimates of demand show a mismatch between demand and, and supply. You name it, I'm not thinking only of cobalt, I'm thinking of what, you name it, lithium and so on, and for good reasons. So the energy transition, which is desirable, but it will be costly, and uh, thank you for calling attention to it. Uh, the industrial policy, yeah, Inflation Reduction Act is not towards reducing inflation. It's a misnomer for industrial policy. And, and the, the issues that I was referring to as the trade-off between efficiency and resiliency, moving uh, in favor of resiliency or, or avoiding geopolitical risks or whatever, is exactly so. That's why you were watching such a widespread use of industrial policy. And let's face it, industrial policies will be inflationary because they replace the efficient configuration of the existing global value chains by other configurations. And frankly, near shoring, uh, French shoring will not be efficient. There will not be ways to obtain efficiency. They will be costly. And, and they will only be feasible if uh, 
uh, if, if someone is accepting to pay subsidies and so on. And finally, reinvent financial system in, after the global financial crisis. Did we really? Look, they, these guys who were in, in, uh, in positions, uh, we curved, we learned to curve the over uh, leverage of banks. That was well done. The banks now. But then simply you had the risk flowing and being increased dramatically by non-banking financial institutions. Non-banking financial institutions that are outside the optic of regulators. And they may, the next round of learning and, and, and fixing crisis may well, be, may well come from that side. Uh, even the central bankers recognize that nobody at this moment has an accurate uh, picture of where is the risk and what are the likelihood and vulnerabilities on this side of uh, the financial system that developed after the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So we, risk morphed, it didn't disappear. On the contrary, uh, given by the magnitude, they may have even increased mm -hmm. dramatically over, now we have everything bubble. Mm -hmm. Before we had the, the real estate bubble, uh, now we have everything bubble. Yep. Uh, th thank you so much, particularly uh, uh, addressing the, the, the last question here, which obviously uh, all of you should chime in here. Um, Harinda, uh, which of the questions do you want to answer? Well, very quickly, three comments. I first agree that there are business cycles, economic cycles, and there are ups and downs, and we shouldn't be overly pessimistic about the current cycle. High inflation, there may be a many recession in the US, maybe a little longer recession in Europe, but they'll come out of it. And we shouldn't focus just on the short term. The Inflation Reduction Act as a misnomer name in my view, I think the big thing in that act is major investments by the US in climate change, which is to me a big investment for the world, not only for the US. And that brings me to the third point. What is the upside? The upside is, and I'm glad there's an opportunity to talk about briefly about climate change, which is really the biggest issue in front of the world we should talk about. I think there's a great opportunity given by now action by US, which is a Europe. There's a competition going to be between European Union and US who can do more on climate change. If it persuades what President Macron said last week, in Washington, that he'll get the European Union to compete with the US on more action on climate change is very positive. They will now join, hopefully, someday China to act on climate change more proactively. There'll be more cooperation, I hope. Um, that's the positive thing, in my view. The world needs to join hands on climate change. And if the interest rates come down, to perhaps 2%, 3% in real terms that will allow, allow the world to invest more. There will be new technologies. As people commit more in next year's COP meeting to ha act more proactively to net zero faster than 2050, they'll need to invest more in climate change into non renewables right. not only by big developed countries, but also developing countries like China and India. Right. And I would like to hope that that will be what will happen. And, and of course, the Atlantic Dialogues, as uh, grave and pertinent and timely as the subject matter is, of course, put climate change as a separate panel, and rightfully so. But thank you, Farinda, for making the connection also to, to the, our discussion here, to inflation. Masood, and then, of course, Dominic, we're going to end with you. You're going to get the final word. Go ahead. Just I just want to make a couple of quick uh, points. On the IRA, I agree with the fact that it's, it isn't what it's called. The best response for Europe is to try and get, for this purpose, yourself treated as an American. So the Canadians and the Mexicans are already treated as Americans for the purposes of IRA, and uh, Europeans aren't yet. So if you can get that for at least some of the components, that would give you access to that. that I think is, second thing, if you're more ambitious, come up with a strategy in Europe to actually launch a serious program of uh, uh, research development on climate change. Uh, second point I want to make uh, quickly is uh, opportunities. 
I w look, the big opportunity is that one consequence of the disruption of gas and oil from Russia, which is going to last now, will be a permanent shift on gas, uh, is going to be a search for alternative and cleaner energy. Short run, everybody's going into doing what they can, more gas, a bit of coal, but longer term, they'll want cleaner energy in Europe. You have a power plant at Noor, the solar plant at Noor, 500 megawatts, roughly, right, here in Morocco. There's no reason why in five years we shouldn't have 5,000 megawatts of solar energy. And then you start thinking of supplying not only Morocco's needs, but you go lines to the south, 70% of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, doesn't have electricity, mm -hmm. and you start building lines to the north. It's cheaper to transport electricity than it is to transport gas. And, and it's cleaner as well. So I think that in the whole, as Harinda was saying, the whole of the energy transition is the biggest growth story for the next decade. And I think emerging markets that get their policy framework right, that have a coherent industrial strategy, and that have a strategic relationship that enables them to be seen as friends for the French shoring, will be able to really take advantage of it. I think Morocco, I personally believe deeply, is very well placed to be a hub for supplying uh, part of that growth story for the next decade. On the decline in inflation, I fervently uh, hope that you are right. Uh, I fear that it's easier to go from 8 to 6% inflation much harder to go from six mm. to two, mm. and uh, we may find that it takes a little bit longer, but I fervently hope that you are right. Th thank you so much, uh, Masoud, for pointing that out. Uh, we're coming uh, to the end of a very, uh, very invigorating, uh, sometimes uh, thoughtful, uh, depressing debate. I'm not gonna use the word depressing, but certainly thought-provoking, uh, Dominic. Uh, many of the questions, of course, you can answer all of them, perhaps, uh, also, also take a deeper dive, as, if you will, into the question about whether the situation that we find ourselves in right now can trigger transformation of the global economic system as we know it. At the end of the day, we all know inflation can, to, can lead to long periods of instability and even undermine democracy. Is this opportunity in crisis, is this a good time to rethink things? Well, um Let's start from one of the questions Masoud already answered, uh, which concerns what kind of reaction we may have in Europe facing the IRA. I think he's perfectly right. Retaliation is ridiculous. OMC is used, UTO is useless. So oh, the only way is to begin to work and to be able to compete mm -hmm. with what the Americans are gonna do. The problem is that I don't see among the European governments a very large um, mm. willing to do so uh, because fragmentation does exist within the European Union itself. So certainly that's the good solution. But you have many countries in, in, in Europe who have, I won't say have decided, mm. but it's as if they had decided that they give up and they accept to be province of the United States. So. The idea that mm -hmm. something could really be built mm -hmm. in the European Union, which I've been fighting for during 40 years, mm -hmm. is not that strong today. Mm -hmm. So the best answer is this one. Will it happen? I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. Then to your point, it will be a big change and an occasion to change. Many other changes like this will take place. But you will have winner and loser. The question is not to let the thing go, things go and see who wins and who loses. Mm. Uh, the, 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 ga the, the game would be to be able, at least, that everybody has some, some benefit of this change. A country we don't talk a lot about, despite our distinguished friend, and which is, in my view, the, the, the potential beneficiary of the move during the 20 coming years is India which is best positioned in terms of demography, in terms of uh, uh, IT, in terms of many, many things to benefit from the mm -hmm. situation. China will have a lot of problems, we know. The US will manage in a very uh, aggressive way. Mm -hmm. 
Good. And then Europe, I already said, I'm not very optimistic. Then comes, we comes to Africa and Latin America. And the problem is to avoid, uh, especially Africa, to, to be finally the loser in this story. So uh, that's why I was asking for more, lend, more uh, effective lending from the IMF, more economic cooperation and so on, which is, in my view, absolutely needed. Because you are right, we will come to an end of this. The question is, who will be living and who will be dying? And uh, I, I don't want the African to be part of the dead. So we need cooperation. We need to understand, and I, I think probably President Biden do understand, but American system is a complicated system. Uh, we, they need to understand that they, in the long run, they cannot have a huge benefit without sharing it with the rest of the world and accepting this cooperation. So yes, the time, uh, all crises, are time for change. And so, so this crisis can be, can be bad changes or good changes. It, it relies upon us to make these good changes, but it relies upon us as a collective body of countries. Some are more aside, China today, okay, we have to deal with that, but we have to work every day to have this international cooperation coming back. It's a very weak level today. Many will say it's dead. I don't believe this. Several times in the 20th century, this thing like this has been said, and finally we succeed, we'll all together succeed to have more economic cooperation. Economic cooperation goes today with political cooperation because there's no economic which is not geostrategic. So economic and political cooperation has to increase with those who wants to go forward. And in this case, we could have a lot of benefit from this mm -hmm. crisis. Again, taking into account that we have to build safety net mm -hmm. for the most vulnerable. If the right lessons are being drawn and uh, the right mechanisms are being implemented, the consequences of inflation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think I speak for all when I say this has, in the past 75 minutes, we've witnessed a very fascinating uh, discussion, uh, many, many facets uh, to this issue called inflation that is affecting us all and from what I gather, Masood, will be affecting us for quite some time to come. Dominic Strauss-Kahn, Taviano Canuto, Harinda Kohli and Masood Ahmed, thank you so much. This is your applause. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my understanding that in this room, uh, the semi-final, by the way, Dominic, you are a Frenchman living in Morocco. <laughs> Two hearts speeding today? As many Moroccans say, it's a, a fight between Papi and Mami. It's very difficult. <laughs> because mom, mom will win or, or, or dad will win, and in both cases, it's a loss loss. So I take the other way around. So it's a win win. It's a win win. I will support Morocco. See, there you have it, ladies. <laughs> By her. This is on the record, but by the way. Also because of theory of games. If Morocco wins, the one I support wins, I'm happy. If Morocco loses, I will find that finally it's not that bad that the French win. <laughs> <laughs> so the best position for me is to support Morocco. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our last plenary for the day. If you want to watch the FIFA World Cup semifinals, we invite you to join us in the Grand Foyer for a cocktail dinner at 7.45 p.m. We invite the rest of our guests to the Moroccan restaurants. Gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for having joined us uh, throughout the day. Uh, this was the last panel of today and uh, we will be glad to see you again tomorrow for new conferences, new content, and new live interviews. Um, tomorrow we will be back with the five plenary session, with the first one starting at 9.30. Uh, so uh, join us again tomorrow. Thank you and good evening. Enjoy the football match. Under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, the Atlantic Dialogues High Level Conference is back with an 11th edition in Marrakesh. Over 350 high level participants will gather from more than 60 countries. Discussions will delve into this year's theme, cooperation in a mutating world, 
opportunities of the wider Atlantic. 11 plenary sessions and 380 talks will take place in Marrakesh. Current crises, multilateralism, inflation, democracy, food security, climate change, global economy, and energy will be discussed. 16 thematic breakout dinners will take place in more intimate settings around the city of Marrakesh for frank and uninhibited discussions. 30 emerging leaders from across the Atlantic, chosen from thousands of applicants, will join the conference after a two-day tailored leadership program. To know more, visit our dedicated website, AtlanticDialogues.org. Under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, the Atlantic Dialogues High-Level Conference is back with an 11th edition in